Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. Thank you all for coming on, joining us tonight. Good to see you, Brother Dwayne. Hey, brother, how you doing? Sister Brittany. Old Faithful, Sister Mary. Good to see you all. We're going to let a few more people come on. Come on. Get started here in about a minute or two. Sister Erlene, how you doing? Good to see y'all tonight. Good to see everybody tonight. Hope y'all doing well. Brother Sean, what's up, man? Just talking about Las Cruces today, my man. Good to see you, brother. We got a good study here tonight coming from the book of Ephesians for being the first and the fourth chapter. And if you are following us in your U booklet from uh, Living Faith, you'll start with us on page 75. You don't have the booklet, no problem. We're going to go line upon line, precept upon precept using the scripture. Praise God, Ephesians 1. I'm excited. I'm, I'm so ready to go. I know people are still coming on, but I'm ready to go because uh, you got to be excited about God's word. You got to love his word. Um, you got to love his word like you love to eat food because it's uh, health to our bodies. The word says one of the scriptures I've been meditating on quite a bit lately is uh, a scripture in Psalms that talks about how the word of God is life to them that find it and health to all of their flesh. And as I start um, seeing it, good brother, good. <laughs> as I start confessing that more and more, it's like it feels like I'm taking medicine into my body when I you know, allow my mind and my heart to take in that word that talks about God's word is life to them that find it and health to all of their flesh. I would encourage some of you who feel um, that there may be some things in your body, even if you are um, struggling with with the disease, the pandemic that's going around now, begin to put that word in your mouth. I'll make sure I confirm it before it's over with, but I believe it's, it's one of the Psalms, one of the Psalms that says, and I, I I'm thinking it's Psalms 107, but it says God's word is life and uh, disease is, is that which takes away from life, but health returns life. So God's word is uh, life to them that find it and health to their body. So uh, I'm going to, um, hey amen, I think I'm going to go ahead and get started. We're about three minutes into our time for Bible study. So. We're going to just pray that those who are coming along will come along, and we're just going to get started. I want to offer prayer before we uh, begin Bible study tonight. So however you reverence God, if you uh, bow your heads, if you close your eyes or look up, whatever you do, will you join me in doing that right now? Dear gracious God, we thank you for another day that we have uh, on this green earth, God that you've given us an opportunity, God, to continue to uh, live and take in and walk and be about and enjoy all of your blessings. For the Bible tells us that in you we live, move, and we have our being. So we are moving today. We're living because you have allowed us to continue to live, move, and you sustain our very lives. So we give you thanks for that today. We give you praise for that today, Lord. Now, I pray that you would, by your spirit, bless and sanctify this time that we're going to have in your word today. God, this word is truly quick. It's powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. This is not just a piece of liter literature. This is a living document that changes the hearts, the lives, and the minds of people who allow it to penetrate them today. That's what I'm praying for, God. I'm praying for spiritual penetration, that this word will go deep into all of our hearts. And I'm praying as the messenger, God, don't uh, don't skip me. Let it penetrate my heart, even as I teach it. Let it penetrate my heart, that it will change and produce the fruit of the Spirit. I pray for everyone that's watching today who is affected by this pandemic or any of the trials and tribulations of life. I pray that you would let this word lift them, bring hope to them. It would encourage them because your word will do everything. It will bless us. It'll heal us. It'll encourage us. It delivers us. All of those things, whatever condition, it consoles us. It'll even comfort us. So whatever condition they find themselves in, let this word meet them and meet their need. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Everyone, please say with me. Amen. I mean, so be it. 
let it be so. Amen. Thank you all for coming on. Sister Tracy, good to see you. Sister Alice, praise God. If you will, if you have your Bibles or if you have this, the, the U Bible study booklet, we use this a lot uh, at our church at Living Faith Cathedral. That's where we're coming to you from right now in the offices of Living Faith Cathedral, 700 West Washington Street, Greenwood, Mississippi, our Bible study night. Amen. And we're going to be coming from, if you're, you've got your book, you can go to page 75. That's where we'll start. If you're tracking us in your Bible, just go ahead and open up to Ephesians, the first chapter. And then I want you to put a marker in that because we'll be reading Ephesians, the first chapter, verses 15 through 19. And then after we get through with those, we're going to jump over to the fourth chapter and read verses one through six. And we're going to unpack those verses here tonight, dealing with a subject called, Did You Get the Call? Let me say that again. The subject tonight is, did you get the call? And our study always asks a question for us to ponder. And the question tonight is, whom has God called? I was just re re refreshing and rehearsing a scripture that we dealt with a couple weeks ago in Bible st in, in Sunday service, um, the, the, the wedding feast parable that Jesus talked about, the feast of the bridegroom. And in that, in that bridegroom scripture, you'll see a very, very uh, well-known passage that many people uh, and in, many ministers often bring up. They'll say, uh, many are called, but few are chosen. Many are called, few are chosen. And I definitely like to make sure that the interpretation of that is correct. Some people think that that calling is selective, meaning that that God calls uh, a few and just selects a few. No, what that means is that God calls, he sends this call out to everyone, but the chosen ones are the ones who respond. So God has called all of us into service to him. Amen. And not just clergymen like myself, not just men of the cloth, women of the cloth, but God has called all of us into service. And that's what our lesson is going to help us highlight here tonight. Amen. So if you will begin to look with me, at Ephesians, the first chapter, starting at verse 15, and we'll read verse 15 through 19. And let me go ahead and give you the three points that we're going to focus on tonight. The first point is going to deal with just one word, called, meaning you are called. Um, and I love it. I love it. And I'm, I'm, I'm excited. So I'm jumping ahead. Some of you may know who Rick Warren is. Rick Warren is a uh, is a American pastor who um, God has used to strengthen the body of Christ and to teach us about church health and church growth. He was one of the the um, the uh, men of God who God used in the 20th and 21st century to help us uh, see how to grow and build in a, a, a wonderful church. He wrote The Purpose Driven Life. He wrote The Purpose Driven Church. And he has a saying. One of his sayings is, every member is a minister. I've never heard it put like that, but sometimes we think that if you're not sitting in the pulpit or if you don't have a white collar on, if you don't wear a robe, that it's not your job to minister. But the lesson tonight is going to is going to dispel that rumor. Everybody, God has called everybody to minister, whether it is your profession or whether it is that you are doing it as your duty. Amen. So let's just read this first passage of scripture here, starting at Ephesians, the first chapter, the 15th verse, remembering that. The title of our uh, Bible study tonight is, Did You Get the Call? 17th verse here says, I'm sorry, I said 15. We're starting at the 17th verse of the first chapter of Ephesians. 17th verse says, I pray that the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, would give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. I pray that the eyes of your understanding may be enlightened, the eyes of your heart, excuse me, may be enlightened so that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what is the wealth of his glorious inheritance in the saints. I want to stop there just for a minute so I can point out something. You see in this first verse, the 17th verse, Paul is praying. He said, this is my prayer for you. He was talking to the Ephesians uh, specifically in this letter that he wrote, but it was meant for every one of us and every shepherd's prayer and Paul's prayer ahead of time. And this is God's prayer that every one of us would be enlightened with the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of God. Now, I want to talk about wisdom for just a second. Wisdom is knowing what to do. It's, it's knowing what to do in every circumstance, having the right knowledge, but knowing how to apply that knowledge. Don't you know some people who are very smart, like they're book smart, they're academically smart, but sometimes they make, um, they're intellectually smart, but something that they make, you know, 
un, unwise decisions, like they make stupid decisions. Like, man, you say that guy is so smart, that gal is so smart, but she's always doing dumb things. Well, intellect and wisdom, they are two different things. Proverbs tells us that wisdom comes from God. And I like to pray like this because there's a scripture in James, I believe it is the first chapter that says, if any of us lack wisdom, let them ask of God who gives to all people liberally and he does it without restraint. So when you don't know what to do, this is a wonderful thing to understand that first of all, um, James tells us that God gives wisdom without restraint if we ask him. So Proverbs tells us as well, he says, the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. So if you want to know how to begin to be able to be wise, you got to start by fearing God. And what I mean by fearing is not just quaking before him or shaking before him. What I mean by fearing him is reverence, meaning you, you respect him and you show respect by what you do, not just by what you say. So there's a lot of people that say, I love God, I respect him, but your, our actions don't show that. Amen. So if you're a man and you're married, you're a woman, you're married, you tell your spouse you love them, but you're never faithful to them. It doesn't matter what you say. You're not showing them respect. And so the same thing with God. If we respect God, if we fear him, what Proverbs says that your wisdom begins when you begin to fear God. And, and, and when it begins there, then that's where wisdom starts. And God gives us wisdom without restraint when we ask him and when we when we bow down to him. And so this passage of scripture that we read here in the second, 17 verse, the prayer Paul had was, it's my prayer that um, the God of our, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the father of, of glory, the glorious father would give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. That word revelation means to, to uncover. OK, when you hear reveal, that means to pull back like something is covered up, but to pull back. And I want you to know something. The blessings of God and all of the precious promises God has, they are covered up to the natural eye. They're not covered or hidden from you, people of God. They are hidden for you. Let me say that again. The blessings of God, the Bible said the natural man, your natural eyes, your natural senses, your hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, seeing, all of those things that we've been given to navigate this world, those things, are, they don't, they don't um, uh, perceive the things of the spirit. So they're hidden from our natural eyes and we need the spirit of revelation, some spirit, the spirit of God that will pull back or uncover God's precious promises. And so this is what Paul's prayer was. He said, the spirit of wisdom and revelation will, will, um, will be manifested, be given to you. Now, this is an interesting thing about the scripture that our lesson points out. This, this is one of nine verses that we'll see in the new Testament. And Paul wrote 13 New Testament books or letters. He wrote 13 of them and only very few of them does Paul address the Trinity in. The Trinity. What I mean by the Trinity? The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And you see here in this verse, he said, God, God, um, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, or the God of our Lord Jesus Christ. Other translations say the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So there's God, the Father, God, the Son, Jesus Christ, and then it talks about the Holy Spirit. So he's talking about the Trinity, and the Bible says in 1 John that the three are one. This is a great mystery in the Bible, talking about the Trinity, meaning the three of them. They're all three distinct personalities, but all one and the same. Man, I can't wait to get to heaven so God can explain that, mm -hmm. because many theologians don't, nobody can really understand how is God uh, eternally existent in three persons, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, but all of them being one. And we try to explain it from a natural perspective, meaning like I'm a father, I'm a husband, and then I'm a son. But it's it's not the same. We, it's not the same as the Trinity. But um, Paul here addresses the tw Trinity and said they're all involved in giving us wisdom and revelation. So before I move on to the next verse, the first thing that I want to make sure you understand is that if you are lacking wisdom about something, if you're lacking wisdom about something, the Bible tells us God will give us wisdom. There is an answer for the problem that you have. It just needs to be uncovered and revealed to you. Somebody ought to say, praise God. That's a prayer. And he says this right here. This is key. 18 verse that the eyes of your understanding will be enlightened. OK, so. That means that your spiritual eyes have to open up so that you can see God's goodness. I love, hallelujah, to talk about Elijah the prophet. 
Elisha was Elijah's predecessors. Elijah is mentioned among the greatest of all times. Elijah, if you hear about Elijah, he called down fire from heaven, you know, with, with the prophets of Baal. You know, Elijah did so many wonderful things. In fact, he was one of the few men, one of the two that I can recall that never saw death. He was taken up into a, a whirlwind, into a chariot of fire. Amen. So he, he, was, he was one of God's most fantastic prophets. But there was a man that came behind him named Elisha. E L I S H A. Elijah, his his predecessor was E L I J H A, a powerful man of God. But he 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 was different in, in, in some senses because Elijah, and I hope y'all follow me, Elijah, he, the one who followed him, Elijah said, um, as as Elijah was talking to him, um, this is an interesting story. And don't y'all try to sidetrack me here because I know you like to sidetrack me, praise God. But but as Elijah was leaving, he was getting ready to be taken up. He, uh, Elijah was following him around and Elijah was trying to shake him. He was trying to see if he could shake him just really to test his faith. And so Elijah said, okay, before the Lord takes me up, Elijah, tell me what I can pray for you and God can give you. He said, this is what Elijah said. He said, I want a double portion of your spirit. So, so all the things God did in your life, I want a double portion of his anointing. And I believe God gave it to him. But I said all that to say this, Elijah, when we talk about the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, and I, you probably heard me mention this before, but Elijah was, as we talked about in one of our Bible studies about two weeks ago, Elijah was a man of God who saw um, with, with word of wisdom, with, with foretelling knowledge from the Holy Spirit, things that would happen in the future. And he was able to warn his king uh, not to go to certain places so he wouldn't be attacked by enemy forces. So those enemy forces, by the Holy Spirit, which is interesting, became aware of the knowledge that God was giving this knowledge of his battle plans to this prophet in Dotham, all right, in Israel. And so this 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 man, uh, King, had the wise or unwise decision to decide to go and try to surround him so that he could kidnap him. But this is amazing. And I love this scripture because it, it gives a image to this passage that we're reading right here. The image it gives is sometimes God can have something before your eyes that he's looking to bless you with, but if you can't see it, it can't benefit you. It won't benefit you. And so God has to open up our eyes. And so when the when the army came and surrounded the prophet's house, um, the king of Syria brought his whole army, surrounded the village where he was in. They were looking to take him over. Elijah's servant went outside first. Elijah's servant, Elisha, his servant went outside first. And what he saw was an invading army about to take them over. And he began to, what I call frolic. He began to run around like a chicken with his head cut off. And he began to uh, uh, say, as one of my friends used to say, what is we going to do? What is we going to do? And, and Elijah then walked outside and he saw something different. Although there was an army surrounding them, an enemy army, what Elijah saw that his servant Gehazi did not see, he saw an army of chariots and fire surrounding that army that was surrounding them. And so this is an important verse that you need to take a hold of. You need to pray that prayer and say, Lord, that's like Paul said, let the eyes of my understanding be enlightened so that I may know, as this scripture says, what is the hope of your calling? Now we're going to get into the first point when we look at this passage. What is the hope of his calling? His calling who for who? For you. And what is the wealth of his glorious inheritance in the saints? So that means what is the wealth of his calling? Many people don't understand that God's calling on your life is valuable. I mean, is valuable. And on top of that, as the scripture points out, people don't understand that God has set aside a wealth of resources for us to be able to impact or affect or employ this calling. And so people, oh, I got to serve God. I guess all I'm, I, all we can do is pray right now. No, the Bible said the weapons of our warfare, they are not carnal, but they are mighty. They are powerful through God to the pulling down of strongholds. And Paul understood that God has laid aside a wealth of resources, spiritual resources for us to be able to walk in our calling. So the first point is this. Number one, you are called. You, if you have accepted Christ as your personal savior, you have a calling on your life. Now, it may not be to preaching the gospel from a uh, office standpoint. And what I mean by office, meaning uh, it is some people walk in the offices. Uh, Ephesians, the fourth chapter around the 11th verse talks about the ministry gifts, right? Talks about apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, evangelists. Okay, those are, are ministry gifts given to the church and those are offices, 
They are offices of ministry and everybody may not be called to an office, but we are all called to service. OK, so I want you to put that aside and remember what we talked about at the beginning, where where where. Where Rick Warren says, every member is a minister. God has called you to a ministry. God doesn't have bench warmers in his body, praise God. Okay, I know it's comfortable to come to church and to sit back there and let the praise team shout you up. It's comfortable to, to, to pull on the pastor and say, pastor, preach me happy or give me a word, minister to me. But the Bible tells us, even in that verse that I was talking about, that passage in Ephesians, the fourth chapter, uh, somewhere around the 11th verse, somewhere around there, he says that God gave us these ministry gifts or these offices for the equipping of the saints, or for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry. And this is what many people get confused. They think that the pastor and all of the ministry offices, people who hold those offices, are the ones who are supposed to do the ministry. But that's not true. Our job is to equip you to do the ministry. Hallelujah. I'm going to say that one more time. It's the pastor's job. It's the prophet's job. It is the apostle's job, the evangelist's job. It's the teacher's job to equip you so that you can do the ministry, the body of Christ. Not that we won't minister, but many people say, okay, pastor, we need a youth program. Go ahead and do it. Pastor, we need a new uh, 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 outreach for the community. You go ahead and do it. No, that's not what the Bible says. That's not consistent with the word of God. And even if you look at the first century church in Acts, when the church first started, the, the, the apostles who were the preachers, the ministers, they got together when it was time to feed the people, when it was time to clothe them, to worry about their needs. And the folks brought it before them and said, hey, our, our women are not getting food to eat. Go ahead and go back and read that about Acts the seventh chapter, somewhere around six, seventh chapter. You'll see. They're like, hey, we we we're not getting food to eat. We got all these administrative issues that we need to take care of that's pertaining to the ministry, the the the, the legs of the ministry, meaning feeding the orphans, feeding the, the widows. And do you know what they said? They said, Listen, y'all pick seven men who are faithful full of the Holy Spirit, and let them be in charge of this. We need to go fast and pray so we can be ready to preach the word. So we don't have time for this, okay? I don't mean that ministers need to say we don't have time to get our hands dirty or do the work. No, what they were saying is y'all need to do this work while we go and hear from God so we can tell, we can fast and we can pray and God can tell us how we can feed you. And then you go and do the work of the ministry, amen? That's what we need to get that straight. So there's no bench warmers. God has called you, praise God. He, if you have accepted God as your Lord and Savior, if you name the name of Christ, if you have been baptized into the faith, amen, I'm gonna talk about that in just a second, baptism to make sure it's clear. Amen, if you've been baptized into the faith, then God has called you to a work in the ministry and you should be ministering. The Bible says that he told us all to go into the world, everybody into the world and preach the gospel. Hallelujah. Everybody, you're supposed to go and preach the gospel. You have to stand in the pulpit to preach. Amen. You have to stand in the pulpit to preach. Go and preach the gospel into all the world and uh, make disciples of them, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He was talking to the church. Praise God. So I want to encourage you, some of y'all that's been sitting there waiting on your pastor and all the ministers to do all the work. Get up. Amen. Bump your neighbor. If your wife right there, elbow her. Say, hey, baby, it's time for us to get up. We need to start doing some work in the ministry. We need to start getting ourselves in motion for the ministry of God. Hallelujah. Somebody say amen. Can I get an amen right there? I already got one. Look at that. Amen. Praise God. Praise God, Sister Violetta. Said that. All right, so let's move on to our second point. So first point is God has called you, and the title of our lesson is Did You Get the Call? So he called you, so did you get the call? Some people say, yeah, I got the call, but you didn't pick up. Hallelujah. So today is the day that you're going to pick up. So not only has God called you to a work in the ministry, a specific um, a specific uh, work that he's called you to that is, that is uh, detailed around your specific gifts and skills and passions that he has put on the inside of you. Let me, let me just pause for a moment to make sure I lift this up. You're saying, Pastor, well, I don't know what I'm called to in the church. Well, let me help you out. Where is a burden in your heart? Is there something that you get burdened about? Is there something that there's a need around that you get burdened about? Do you see children in the church or you see children and see that they need care and that just burdens you? Or... Is there a burden for people who are lost? You know, then you may need to join the evangelism team. If there's a burden for, for making sure that children get the care they need and making sure that they get, maybe you should be a part of the youth ministry. Wherever your burden is, that's most likely an indicator of where your call is. Okay, so if you don't, and, it, and, and you say, well, what if I don't know if I have a burden? That's why you need to be a part of a church. Because 
In that church, there are ministry gifts, just like the pastors, the prophets, the evangelists, the teachers, and, 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 and uh, all of those that are involved in that five-fold ministry group that they can affirm and see in you. Oh, no, I see that God has called you to exhortation. God has called you to mercy, or God has called you to a, 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 a giving ministry. You understand what I'm saying? So the body of Christ works together in this sense. So we are called to a work. And then number one, we are called to a lifestyle. All right, that's number two. We're called to a lifestyle. And this right here won't get me a whole lot of amens, but it is the truth. Okay, so you are called to, to represent the Lord Jesus. Let me read this passage that's underneath it. The 19th verse. OK, it says, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the mighty working of his strength? OK, I got to go to the fourth chapter now. If you're in your Bibles and following us, turn to the fourth chapter of Ephesians and the first verse. And this is where we're going to pick up our second point, which means you're called to a lifestyle. So you're called to ministry, but you're called to a lifestyle. Therefore, I, Paul says, I'm the prisoner of the Lord. I urge you to live worthy of the calling you have received. Okay. So let me stop there for a minute. What that means right there is that Paul, look at the language he used. He said, I'm a prisoner. All right. And so that's what you need to understand that we are voluntary. When you accept Jesus Christ, okay, we are voluntary prisoners of the Lord. I mean, we make ourselves captive to what he desires. Now, if you're not saved, if you have not been born again, if you have not accepted the Lord as your savior, you're a prisoner, but you just don't know it. You are a prisoner. The Bible said the enemy takes people captive, meaning Satan. He takes people captive at his will. God does not take us captive. We have to surrender our will and our life to him. And he will never hold us captive even after we surrender. But if you don't accept God, because God frees us to be able to serve him. So if you haven't accepted Christ as your savior, you are not free to serve. You think you're free to do whatever you want to do, but you're actually bound. You're captive right now. You're a prisoner. You're a prisoner to sin. Amen. That means you can't do nothing but sin. When God sets us free, we have a choice. We can either walk in, in, in his word. We can either walk by his spirit or we can choose to sin. But you don't have a choice if you're not, if you're not been born again. So, but Paul says, I'm a willing prisoner. What that means? What 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 are prisoners like? What's what's the life of a prisoner? Well, prisoners they follow rules about when they sleep, where they go. They even follow rules about where they what they wear and what they eat. And even it can even get down to who you associate with. Okay, you get to uh, you get to being rambunctious or whatever. They can they can exclude and confine your association. And so God will never he will never take our submission. We have to give it to him. But we are called to a lifestyle. What lifestyle are we called to? Look at what second verse of uh, the fourth chapter of Ephesians says. We're called to a lifestyle of humility, humbleness. Why humility? Humility because the Bible says that God is humble. Okay? We're called to gentleness. Amen? Some of our other books say kindness, patience, <coughs> bearing with one another in love. Our lesson asks us this question. When you look at humility, because humility, the Bible said God resists the proud and he gives grace to the humble. What does humble humility mean? Humility means that you don't think of yourself more than you ought to be. And you don't think you deserve more than you do. You don't deserve to be blessed. God has blessed you with life, health, and strength. You don't deserve a brand new car. If he blesses you with it, it's his prerogative, and you should thank him. If he blesses you with four squares, meaning four meals a day, enough food to eat, and just some clothes that you can wear on your back, he doesn't owe you that, but that's a blessing. That's being humble, understanding that God is in control. So when God orchestrates your life into such a way, even that, though it doesn't seem like it benefits you, humility says, not my will, but your will be done. Humility says what Job says. Even though things were happening in his life, he began to lose his wealth. He began to lose his health. He lost parts of his family. He said, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Only a humble heart can do that. Job said like this, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Y'all trying to keep me on here long. Praise God. But I'm just going to be done in about 10 minutes. Give me about 10 more minutes and we're going to finish this out. But humility, we have to be humble to serve God. So when if you're not humble, 
um, then that means that you you won't ever be able to be God's prisoner because you won't you won't take what God allows. You won't accept what He allows. You'll feel like I need this, I deserve this. I'm not taking this. I'm not going to do that. I don't want to go to that church. I don't want to go to church. Period. I want to serve the Lord from the house. Well, that's not what the Bible said. The Bible said, "For that sake, not the assembling of yourselves together." And so much the more as you see the day approaching. So God said, "You got to go to church if you're His prisoner. If you have submitted your life to God to that lifestyle, then you don't get to make that decision." Now, I know you don't like what I'm saying. God talks about giving. He said that, will a man rob God? You said, wherein have we robbed God? In tithes and offerings. He said, bring all the tithes and offerings into the storehouse that they might be meat in my house. That's the word of God. That's not Pastor Lawson's word. That's not your pastor's word. That's not T.D. Jakes' word. That's not uh, 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 Kenneth Copeland's word. It's not any preacher's word. That's God's word. And when you're a prisoner, you don't have a choice. You do what God has called you to do. So Paul says, I'm a prisoner of the Lord. I urge you to walk worthy of this. Let me ask you this question. What area of your life has not been imprisoned by the word of God? We got some. I want you to think about that now. And what areas of your life are you running free on your own, doing what you want to do? And you say, how do I know that? If you're running outside of what God's word says, if God says to bless him and you cursing people out, you, you, you're you free. You're running free. You're a runaway, you're a runaway prisoner. That's what you are. You're on the loose. You're a fugitive. Amen. If God says, you know, uh, pray for those who despitefully use you and you you cussing them out, tell them God break their leg and, you know, Lord, let they, let their wheels fall off their tire when they're rolling down the street. You, that's not God's word. You are living wild. I mean, you done broke out of the prison. Okay. Amen. But the Bible says, as you said, well, Pastor, keep talking about prison. I'm using the words he used. But Jesus said it like this. He said, come unto me. See, it's not what you think. All ye that are laboring and heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke, and the yoke is, is similar to this word prison. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly at heart. When you become God's prisoner, he said, then you will find rest for your soul. See, we're out there struggling, trying to do our own thing, trying to make it happen on our own, and we're not resting. We don't have peace. Talked about this today when we were when we were sharing in our staff meeting at the school. One of the things God gave me to talk about was peace, the peace that passes all understanding. When you're on your own, you don't have peace. If you're in the middle of this pandemic trying to figure it out for yourself, you don't have peace. You got the, you, you don't have God's burden and his yoke upon you. He said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And I always tell people that when you take the trip on your own, then you have to pay the fare. But when you when, when you take the trip God has put you on, he's responsible for paying the fare. Somebody ought to say amen right there. So when God sends me to do something, whatever it costs, God is responsible. But when I take a step on my own, see, even as from this prisoner uh, a reference that we're making right here, the, 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 the prison system, the, the, the government is responsible. Whoever is responsible for your food, for your clothing. On your own, you're responsible for yourself. Okay? So we have to be a prisoner. We are called to a lifestyle. What's that lifestyle? Humility and holiness. That's another one I need to talk about real quick. Praise God. Holiness. We must be holy. You can't do what you want to do and then say that you are Amen. Call to the to the service of the Lord. If you are called, not only does it call the blessings upon you and call you to ministry, but it calls your attitude, your actions, your words, your lifestyle, your disposition. It calls it into certain alignment with God's word. You know, people use this today. They use this old phrase. It's kind of old now, but they would say this WWJD, right? Remember, what would Jesus do? So this is really, I mean, it's really a great phrase. If you are doing something that Jesus would not do, you are now walking in your calling. Come on, somebody. We're called to a lifestyle. Amen. We're called to ministry, but we are also called to a lifestyle. I got to move on from there, but that's real good. I just need you to understand that God has called us to a certain way of living. The Bible said, let everyone that names the name of Christ. I mean, if you wear that name on your bumper sticker, if you've attached it to your life, he said, then we should refrain from all riotous living. And there's a whole bunch of things that are connected to riotous living. Amen. But we got to get this under control. Read the lesson some more. Amen. Read these verses where it talks about in Ephesians, uh, where it talks about that we have to put on the new man, put on the new life. Okay. The old life, I, I, old man would have cussed you out when you did that. The new man will pray for you and bless you. The old man might have cheated, you know what I mean, on this, on this one, on my taxes. But the new man don't cheat. Because God don't cheat. You, you understand what I'm saying? The old man might have told some lies. And I'm not saying that we don't we don't misspeak. 
<laughs> Sometimes we misspeak. That's an easy way of saying that we lie, a clean way of saying we lie. Sometimes the, the old man might be prone to misspeak, but the new man does not tell lies. And when he does, he or she repents. See, that's being a prisoner of God. That's the lifestyle that we are called to. We're also called to a life of moral and physical purity. Hey, amen. So I could get on into that, amen, if I want to, but I ain't going to get all into that too much, how we said in the Delta here. I ain't going to get into it too much, but we are also responsible for what we put our hands on and what I, what, what amen, what we put our hands on and what, what where we find our feet walking and moving. If Jesus wouldn't put his hands on it, hallelujah, I'm preaching good. I'm, 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 I'm preaching better than y'all uh, typing amen, hallelujah. If he wouldn't put his hands on it, if he wouldn't go there, if he wouldn't be there, if he wouldn't do it, amen, you're called to not do it as well, hallelujah. Last point. The last point is, first, we're called, and second, we're called to a lifestyle. Third, we are called to a unified faith. This is important for church people, hallelujah. I learned a great lesson in this about four or five years ago. What does this mean? The Bible tells us here, and I guess I got to read that last verse so you understand it. Um, looking at the third verse, it said, Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. The fourth verse of the, of the fourth chapter of uh, Ephesians said, There is one body, one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope at your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all. And then you all, first and foremost, there ain't no denomination in, in the body of Christ, when it's talking about the body of Christ, it's not talking about the local church. If you have accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are part of the universal body of Christ. It don't matter if you baptize in the name of Jesus, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. It don't matter if you just acknowledge Jesus' name, things like that. It don't matter if you if you have church on Saturday, if you have church on Sunday. Those things don't matter. What matters is we are part of the body of Christ. And whether your local church or your denomination functions that way, about salvation oriented issues we need to be unified okay we might not things that don't have any salvation bearing any uh salvific bearing on it we just agree to disagree about it but not fall out about it but we got to be unified in that you're my brother you're my sister meaning as we saw in those scriptures above we need to be patient with one another maybe you don't believe in in the speaking of tongues okay all right, so will that send you to hell? Probably not. So I'm saying we don't need to fight about it and, and then fall out and go to our corners. Hey, you speak in tongues, and, and I speak in tongues, and then you don't speak in tongues if you don't want to, as long as you baptize in the Holy Spirit, praise God, as long as you believe God and you walk according to the Word of God, you're going to be all right. I'm going to be all right. You, just speak in, you don't speak in tongues, I speak in tongues. Amen. You sprinkle baptize, and I immerse. So what's the difference? Get baptized. Hallelujah. The Bible said we are baptized. One faith, one baptism, one Lord, one spirit. Okay. And so even in our local churches, we have a problem of disharmony and a lack of unity. And we don't know how much this inhibits the work of the Lord. Now, I got about two minutes and I'm going to shut this off right here. I'm going to finish you. I thank you all for sticking with me for this time. But the Lord showed me this. You don't understand how the power of God is inhibited in your, your fellowship when you have people that are not unified in your in, in your church or in your local body. When there God showed me this, we had some disharmony some years ago in our church and it was it was some strife. And then we were working on trying to fix it, but it stayed there. And it seemed like we were having, you know, pretty good church. All that stuff, you know, it didn't seem like a big deal, even with the little bit of strife that was going on. You know, schism, different cliques and groups that don't associate and deal with this group. Well, this folks mad at this folk, that, that, those kind of things going on, and you functioning like that, not unified. It really restricts what God can do in your life. And then once the Lord had us clear this up, once we got clear to this situation, immediately, I'm talking about like the next Sunday after this situation was taken care of, the, the, the spirit of God began to move in our service like we had never, never seen before. And I heard the Holy Spirit say, you see what strife does? You see what I'm saying? He told me, he showed, so he showed this to me. When you're not unified as a body, amen, when you're not on one accord, you think everything is going well, but it may be some people in your body, in your church that are sick, and they ain't going to get well until you get that strife out of your church. It may be some people who need blessings or the church may be praying for a financial blessing or something that God to do that needs to be miraculous. But people aren't together and they're doing everything else. It seems like it's right, but they're not unified or there's some schism that has not been addressed by the body. That will stop God from being able to move in the full capacity that he wants to move. So if you're a leader, if you're a member in the church and you got some schism going on or something like that, or even if you might not be the leader, but you might be somebody that's in the middle of some kind of split or some kind of division, you need to stop it. 
You need to stop. You need to pray and say, God, give me a clean and forgiving heart so that I can walk away from this because who knows? It may be your miracle that's being held up by the, the disharmony and the lack of unity that is in that body. I, I truly believe this, and God showed this to me. I believe that many miracles don't happen in some of our churches because the church will not do the work of getting unified, putting all of the petty stuff aside. You're sitting in my seat. Uh, you, I got upset with you uh, five years ago. I don't deal with you. That kind of foolishness, that kind of stuff keeps God from being able to move in our midst. And so we're called to this. We're called to unify faith. We're called to a lifestyle of holiness, hum humility, lifestyle of humility, lifestyle of holiness, a lifestyle of meekness and gentleness where we are kind to one another. And then we are just called. So, so the important thing you need to understand about this lesson today is that you need to start walking in your calling. The lesson is entitled, Did You Get the Call? And I'm telling you today, God is calling some of us to a higher place of functioning and working in his body. OK, and now in this day and with this pandemic going on in the day that we're living in, God is bringing us to task for, for not walking in the calling. I believe that. I believe that many of us who have not been obeying the call, that we will suffer for that. Amen. And I don't want to suffer. That includes me. I want to do what God's calling me to do. So I don't. Uh, God, you ain't got to do all that to me. I'm just saying hey, when I need to be healed, I need you to heal me. I don't need you. to. I don't need to be having in the back of my mind. I didn't do what he told me to do. Am I doing what he told me to do? It affects your faith. It stops you from being able to believe him fully. Okay? So I want to just thank God for that today. I thank God for you all being with, with us today here at Living Faith Cathedral for our Bible study. This was a good lesson. I thank God for it. Um, I want to pray before we leave here today. Um, I'm, I want you to know something. I know that we have people who are coming up left and right who are being touched by this pandemic you know, in their bodies, in their circumstances, but there's also people who are being blessed. God is healing a lot more than, 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 than this, in, this disease is destroying. God is touching the lives and hearts of many more people than are being destroyed. I heard um, the interesting thing about this. I heard one of, the, um, one of the leading American pastors in terms of their reach in the city. I love uh, listening to him. Amen. Uh, uh, and he re he writes different things and he, you know, you see him in different places. Um, and, and he was talking about how since the pandemic started, you know, he said he usually during the weekend, he has 35,000 members that come through a touch by their service. And since the first week of their going on live, going, going, you know, live Facebook or streaming and not having church, he was able to touch and reach 195,000 people. Man, I'm talking about explosion in terms of the reach. So God is reaching way many, more people in the middle of this scenario. He talked about a, another minister here, uh, Craig Goshel, I believe that's his name. And I remember uh, sitting through a service that he did many years ago when I was at Columbia International University, and he'd written a, written a book called It. And uh, he was teaching there, and the, the church that he was he was uh, pastoring, has been pastoring, was growing. And uh, uh, and one of the things that they said that, that, that was revealed about him, about 1,000 people a week were giving their lives to the Lord due to his ministry. He has the largest church in America. I mean, 1,000 people a week. But after the pandemic hit and, and they began to go all live streaming, get this, reportedly 15,000 people a week giving their heart to the Lord. See, but you ain't going to hear that on CNN. So you won't hear that on CNN. You're not going to hear that on Fox News because that's not what they're focused on. You know, you're going to hear that. Uh, you only hear that when you're listening to the voice of God. That's why our lesson today tells us that we need to make sure that the eyes of our understanding are being enlightened and that we know what the hope of God's calling is and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints is. Right. So God has the power to reach out. And I'll say this last thing before I get ready to close here. And that is is that you got to understand that you look at the, 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 the Acts, the book of Acts, the first century church, you'll see that God's church began to expand, expand, the body of Christ began to expand when persecution came and people got spread out. And so the gospel began to spread. So God's word is spreading right now. People are getting saved right now by, you know, phenomenal proportions. 
epic proportions. People are getting saved. They're hearing the message. It's spreading across the world. So God is moving his blessing, and we got to be able to see what God is doing, just like Elijah was able to see what his servant Gehazi couldn't see. Some people only see death and tragedy in the midst of this, but there are other people like you and I who have our eyes open, and we're receiving this prayer that Paul prayed, that the eyes of our understanding would be enlightened, and that we would know what is the hope of his calling, what the riches of the glories of the heritage and saints. We don't see just pandemic and problems. We see the Holy Spirit moving all around this globe. Can you say amen to that? He say amen. Let's pray. Father God, thank you today for blessing us again with another opportunity to gather in the name of Jesus. And thank you for your word that you have provided us such a precious gift that we often, including me, we often take it for granted. We don't value this life-giving word that is able, the Bible said, to make us wise unto salvation. And the Bible tells us that this word is living, it's quick, it's sharp, it's powerful than more any two-edged sword that it divides between soul and spirit, joint and marrow. And it is a discerner of the intents of our heart. It is the word that heals us. The Bible said it is the word that provides for us. You sent your word and healed us. God, your word tells us that the word is what we shall live by, not bread alone, but every word that comes out of your mouth. It's your word that breaks down and destroys the yoke, the anointing. It's all about your word and everything that's in your word. Thank you for this word, God. And I pray for everyone that's listening to the sound of my voice and everyone who is connected to those who are listening to the sound of my voice that's in their circle of influence. They may not be listening to this word right now, but they may just be connected to uh, the people of God. And I'm praying for them right now, God, that every sickness, every disease, every trouble that has come upon them as they put their faith in you, they will be able to see you as their healer. They will be able to come to know you as their deliverer. They will be able to come to know you as one who uh, 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 sets them free and who is the answer, the way, the truth, and the life. I don't know how to pray for every problem out there, but I thank God that I don't have to know because your word said that when we don't know what to pray for as we ought to, that the spirit makes intercession with moanings and groanings that cannot be uttered. So Holy Spirit, pray for every need that is connected to us tonight. Every sickness, every loneliness, every heartbreak, every mind that needs to be regulated, every uh, 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 ailment in the body, God, every disharmony or disruption that is in inside of God ordained relationships. That's my prayer, God, in the name of Jesus. Every head that's hung down, lifted up, God, in the name of Jesus, as they look to you, every bit of faith that is that is small, God, uh, increase it as they hear this word. In the name of Jesus, every demon and every demonic spirit and every stronghold that is holding on to your people, God, let it be bound. I bind it now for you said whatever we bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever we loose upon earth shall be loosed in heaven. And God, right now, I lose peace. I lose peace across to your people. I lose understanding and revelation to the people of God. I lose faith and trust and radical faith. I lose, uh, God, just, just a mindset to try you and to, and to go after you with record reckless abandonment. I loose it now in the name of Jesus, and I thank you for it, and I praise you for it. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. God bless you. We love you all. Thank you for joining us tonight. Look forward to seeing you. Listen, if you're from Living Faith, hallelujah, praise God. Amen. Hallelujah. If you're from Living Faith, you're in the city of Greenwood in the beautiful Mississippi Delta. We're going to offer you an opportunity this weekend to, to drive by, hallelujah, and take communion with us. We'll also be handing out our new um, you booklets. We're almost at the end of our Bible studies with this one. So if you're not, it's not necessary. It's not mandatory. But if you want to come by and just be able to lay your eyes on the church, amen, and we're going to make sure everything is sanitized and everything is in compliance. We'll be gloved up. Pastor going to be masked up, gloved up. I'll be able to see you for about five Five or 10 seconds, 15 seconds when you drive through, we'll administer the body and blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and uh, you can you can say amen and just keep keep on going in the name of Jesus. So if you are interested in that, this Sunday, 1215 to 115, we'll probably stay extra 15 minutes for a few of y'all that be on that, you know, CP time, praise God. We'll stay a few more minutes for y'all to come on through and come in and, and get some as well. And then you'll be able to pick up our new Bible study books, we have those as well. And it's no, you know, don't worry about what the normal, uh, the normal um, donation that goes toward that. This is what we want to bless you with as a church. Praise God. So I love you. You see, I love you because I'm still hanging on here. I should be gone. Praise God. But listen, look forward to seeing you all then. May God bless you and keep you and may his face shine upon you. And may he be gracious unto you in Jesus name. All right. I'll let y'all later.